Uh, Joanne, roll call, please. Yes, sir. Director Coverdell? Yes, here. Director Feldman? Here. Director Larimer? Here. Vice President Reynolds? Did he answer? Yeah, I did. Thank okay, thank you. And President Michelson? Uh, here. Great. All present. Thank you. Okay. We we'll all rise and we have our flag here. Uh, like to leave Don't have my flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Thank Amen. You. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a public comment or something that is not on the agenda? Hearing none, uh, Director Feldman, how did you find the uh, claims to be? I found the claims to be in order. Uh, good, anyone have any questions or comments, uh, items they'd like uh, to discuss on the- I would like to pull the um, financial reports. Okay, help me at what, uh, what letter of the alphabet was that? Um, I apologize to you. I'm, I'm not sure. In the consent calendar, the financial reports, one of them contained the uh, CIP, the expenditures uh, currently. That would be uh, item 4B. Yeah, Thank you. B. B. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll pull B. To, uh, we have a motion to uh, accept the consent calendar with the exception of B. So move. Uh, I'll make a I'll make a motion to accept the consent calendar, accepting item B. Uh, John, please. Uh, yes, Second. Director Cover Coverdale. Yes. Director Feldman. I can't. Yes. Hear. Director Larimer. Yes. Vice President Reynolds. Yes. Director Michael President Michelson. Yes. Okay. Uh, Ken. So I, I had a question. Sure. I was reading through the uh, uh, capital improvement uh, budget and the expenditures to date. At the very end of the report, there were two line items that caught my attention. I just wanted to ask a question about them. And it stated that $2 million of the CIP was carryover work from last year. And so my question is, where it looked like it was around 4.7 million, I don't, I don't have it right in front of me, uh, that we had budgeted and we were spending around, we were predicting around 5.3, something in the, those. Is it really that 2 million comes forward, so it's a $6.6 .6 million budget, and we're spending 5.3, or is it truthfully a 4.6 and 2 million of that 4.6 is from last year? That was my question. The, um, so we did not spend $2 million last year. So some of those projects have carried over. So if we spend everything that we're thinking about spending, which includes two of the projects tonight on the, uh, up uh, for your approval, uh, we will spend in the range of 5.7 million um, as um, and versus the, the 4.9 million and then plus 2 million from last year. So we're, we're still, so that's one of the reasons why if we start looking at our cash balances right now, we're around 9 million um, and uh, we were uh, projected uh, pro uh, two years ago to be around seven million at this time. You're on mute. Again, if I can go forward with that, then our truthful budget for this year isn't 4.9 or whatever, but it's really 6.9. Right, yeah. We're spending $2 million from last year's budget. So the truth of the matter is we're still not spending the full proposed budget. We'll be spending somewhere on the order of 5.3, but it's 5 really 6.9. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. That was the only thing I wanted to ask about. 
but we'll be doing our part to stimulate the economy. So that's a good thing. Bob, there's your factor. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, are, are you good with that explanation? Is that no, adequate? Yeah. Okay, then we, do we have a motion to accept? Yeah, it's fine. 4B? Yeah. Bob, so move. Can you want to? I'll second it. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll move. 4B. Okay. So I think we have first, first and second. Joanne? Uh, second. Yes. Director Coverdell? Yes. Thank you. Director Feldman? Yes. There. Okay, thank you. Director Larmer? Yes. Vice President Reynolds? Yes. yes. And President, President Michelson? Yes. Thank you. All eyes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, item five meetings attended. Uh, director, comments? Directors? Twelve months. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was up in Tahoe over the weekend. Don't tell anybody I, I le left my stay in place, but. There, there's hardly any snow up there. Trails are open. Mountain biking is is on. <laughs> all, all good. And there were a lot of people on the trails. No one was wearing masks. It was like, oh my god, this never happened. But that's my snow report. Um, so anyone else? Okay, uh, hmm. moving on. I can then. tell you that it's <laughs> snowing today. Yeah, I know. I did. Right now. <laughs> that's why I came home yesterday. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, Joe, uh, Mary, please moving to general business, uh, 6A. Okay, I'll turn it over to Kathleen. Okay, good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Good, okay. Um, so on our virtual remote meeting today, uh, we have Elizabeth Dreyer. She's representing West Yost Associates. So I just wanted to uh, introduce her. Um, so staff is recommending that the board authorize the general manager to execute a contract with West Yost Associates to assist staff with the preparation of the district's 2020 urban water management plan. The staff report, report provides a little bit more detail, but I'll start with a, a brief background on California urban plans. So California urban water suppliers are required to adopt and submit an urban water management plan every five years. The Urban Water Management Planning Act was enacted in 1983 with the intent to set uniform statewide standards for water resource planning. It has been amended to add additional elements related to water conservation and water reliability since it was first enacted. District staff has already started working on the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan with FOSCA and with Medaus Water Management to prepare water demand projections over a 20 year planning horizon, which is what is required by the uh, Urban Water Management Planning Act. So Bosca will also be coordinating with San Francisco Water to get um, additional required information on uh, water reliability for our imported water and even uh, items like climate change for the watershed. So district staff will be providing the content and data required for the urban water management plan and providing that to West Yost. The West Yost team will collect and review the district's data and information, attend meetings, uh, prepare the administrative draft and then the final draft of the report plan, provide support related to the public hearing, provide project management, provide quality control, quality assurance, and then prepare the final urban water management plan as adopted by the board of directors. So while staff can start working on elements of the urban water management plan independently, it does not start coming together as a plan until the state releases their guidance document that describes how they want all the information and data formatted and reported. This guidance document is not expected until fall and it may be delayed due to work interruptions from COVID-19. So West Yost team will be a valuable resource for the district to efficiently prepare the district's urban water management plan and um, to move up the deadline, which is July 1st, 2021. So I can take any questions that the board may have regarding the proposal in the urban water management plan. Kathleen, is this, which, is this our third plan? I forgot when we did these before. 
Is this the third urban water management plan we've done? Oh, no, we've done, well, the district has done many more, but this will be the third one that I've produced here. Oh, okay, I mean that you should do. And did yeah. West Joe's do the prior ones too? I forgot. Yes, we've hired so This West is the third West. time that they'll be working with you to do this. Yes. And is the pricing about the same as it was the previous time? Let's get the numbers. Um, so last year, I believe it, uh, it was a proposal for about $55,000. Okay. If I remember correctly. Okay, so slightly more than. And number two, is there any likelihood or is your opinion that they will, in fact, uh, because of the COVID 19 issue, delay the requirement for July 1 of next year based on getting you the information you probably need later than you may be able to get it, you know, into here? Um, That's the question. It would be highly unlikely because it would take an act of the legis California legislature okay. to uh, amend the date. So um, I do not think that it will be extended, but um, you never know. Okay, I just, okay, there could be some kind of special thing made for it, but right now, no. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? I do. Uh, could you tell us uh, uh, with the groundwater sustainability plan, do we need to coordinate with other facilities in the community? So we weren't required to do a groundwater sustainability plan because of how um, our basin, that Half Moon Bay Terrace Basin, is ranked uh, by the state. Uh, we're very low priority. Um, that could change in the future, but as of now, we aren't required to do one of those plans. We do have, um, we will put our groundwater information into the urban water management plan. Uh, some of that information will be part of uh, from CASGEM, which we do part participate in, which is the uh, California State Groundwater Elevation uh, reporting system. Uh, and, you know, so there will be a description of our groundwater in the plan, but it won't, we will not have a groundwater sustainability water management plan in there. And thank you for staff's efforts in getting our watershed downgraded because that would have been a very, very expensive proposition to do a ground, groundwater study. And it was based on erroneous information that they wanted us to, to do that study. So having it downgraded, uh, it's a huge money savings for us. So thank you. Um, I'd like to else? move that we <clears throat> direct staff to approve the proposal from West Yost to uh, help us with the urban water management plan. I'll, I'll second that. Second it. Okay. okay, Bob, you, you can have it. Um, okay, all those, Joanne? Yes, and that was for a time and materials cost not to exceed $67,300? That's correct. Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, Director Coverdale? Aye. Director Feldman? Yes. Director Larimer? Yes. Vice President Reynolds? Yes. President Michelson? Yes. Thank you, all aye. <laughs> Okay, item B, if COVID wasn't bad enough, now we have to worry about uh, PG&E shutoffs, so okay, more I money. Will, <laughs> I will turn this one over to James. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, board members. Uh, as you know, or, or may remember, the Deniston Water Treatment Plant and Raw Water Pump Station do not have backup emergency power. Uh, the district hired TJC and Associates to draft a procurement spec for a couple of gen sets with automatic transfer switches uh, in the event that uh, for planning that if we have a power outage at the Deniston Water Treatment Plant, they, uh, we procured the, the generators and automatic transfer switches uh, through SourceWell uh, to save the markup. Um, we went out to bid. We only got one bidder, uh, Andrini Brothers. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, we were scratching our heads about that because other people said they were going to bid. But 
we're, we're thinking that, believe it or not, people are busy enough where they um, weren't interested in this small of a project. So Andrini Brothers came in on May 1st at 277 for installation. This is for conduit, uh, some demo at the water plant and the booster pump station, uh, sizable pads that will survive earthquakes, of course, and the uh, offloading of the equipment installation. The bid was 277, 458. The engineer, engineer's estimate was 200,000. So we were a little surprised there, but with uh, the bidding environment that we're seeing right now, um, we would like to move forward with it, especially since we're gonna be. So we're requesting you to authorize the general manager to um, enter into contractual agreement with Andrini Brothers for the installation of two generators and two automatic transfer switches at the Deniston treatment plant and pump station for the amount of 277. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer. 458. Yes. Thanks, Joanne. Okay. Are there thoughts? Board? Motion? I was just interested in Andrini. I was unaware that they actually did this type of stuff versus construction and the normal stuff. And I just, this is part of their charter as well. Jane? They do the underground and the contract requires a, a GC license and they're going to sub out to Pelizari who did the transformer at the raw water pump station last year. Okay. So th that's the reason okay. it's not okay. just an electrical contract but there's underground work required. Okay, but they'll get it done. I mean, we know they're good for it. So oh, absolutely. Sure, absolutely. No, no Thank you. Okay, do I hear a motion? Yeah, this is Glenn. I'll make a motion that we, uh, let me find it here and read it for Joanne. I make a motion that we award the contract for the installation of Denison standby generators and automatic transfer switch for 277 comma 458 for Andrini Brothers. I'll second it. Okay, Joanne, please. Yes, Director Coverdell? Yes. Director Feldman? Yes. Director Larmer? Yes. Thank you. Vice President Reynolds? Yes. President Michelson? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, item 6C, Denison Culvert Replacement and Paving Project. Is that James, you handling yes. that too? Yes. I am. Please. So um, we, we had EKI help us with uh, some design and specs for redoing the road to the Deniston tank. As the directors have been out there, they'll recall it's a very steep slope in the watershed back there at the water treatment plant. Um, we even did a hazard assessment. And when we looked into the road failure, uh, the culverts are a corrugated metal pipe. They're all severely corroded and really the cause of the road failure. So rather than pave over old culverts, we're gonna be replacing those with HDPE. We went out to bid on April 10th and Half Moon Bay Paving and Grading was the low bid at 383, 342. And staff is recommending that we uh, get this road and the paving around the plant uh, in before next winter. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm available to answer. Anyone have any questions? No, how long is it gonna take them to do this? Uh, good question. I don't think it'll be more than a few months. And they could get started ASAP? Yeah, I think Gina's working on the notice to proceed in the contracting uh, as soon as we get it approved. Good. Okay, that said, do I have a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we, uh, oh, hang on, let me read it. I make a motion we authorize the general manager to enter into a contractual agreement with Half Moon Bay grading and paving for 383, 342 to repave Deniston Tank Access Road, replace storm drain culverts and add paving around the water treatment plant. Thank you. I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, Joanne, please. Yes, uh, Director Coverdell. Yes. Director Feldman. Yes. Director Larimer. Yes. Vice President Reynolds. Yes. President Michelson. Yes. Thank you. Okay, who is handling 6D? 
Is that? I am. Okay. Uh, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure it was you or Dave. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, in 2011, uh, the district entered into a professional services agreement with Analytical Environmental Services, um, AES, uh, for environmental consulting uh, uh, to prepare the um, uh, environmental impact report for the Deniston San Vicente supply project. So in 2015, the EIR was finalized and certified. Uh, Note that the um, EIR outlines the components of the Denison San Vicente water supply project and um, completion of the ER, EIR was a condition by the State Water Resources Control Board uh, for an uh, extension of time to be granted for our permit. So now in January 2020, finally, we, um, the district was granted uh, the extension of time for our permit. So our staff rec rec uh, recommends engaging AES now to provide additional environmental services in our efforts to move forward with the water supply project now that we have the extension. So AES will be working with us on the next steps, which includes um, biological surveys and assessments, assistance with permitting, with resource agencies, and in-stream flow study work plans. So we are um, recommending that we move uh, the uh, move forward and that the board approve the um, time and materials proposal for 110,000. Um, separately, um, staff is also engaging Stetson Engineering for 28,000 to provide engineering services um, that are needed by AES in their work. So any questions? Yes. Yeah. So the hundred and the hundred and ten thousand does not include the twenty eight thousand. Correct. Twenty eight is in addition to that. Right. So it's really a hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars. Is that correct? Correct. Thanks. Yeah. And the twenty eight is a separate transaction, or you're able to authorize that? Yeah, because it's under the thirty. Okay, your limit is excellent. Yeah, I forgot what the limit was too. Uh, Jim, you have a comment? Yeah. No, this is a step toward polishing up the <laughs> TIR. This is the next step in getting to the point where we can we, we can uh, execute our rights on that property and begin the process of uh, moving forward. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Jim, please. Yeah, I, I, when you look at this document, we uh, uh, second fourth uh, statement, you see that there are actually six agencies that we have to approve from. And they're all approving exactly the same project in a slightly different perspective. Three of them are federal and three of them are state. And I wonder if there's some way <clears throat> we could uh, write to our congressmen, write to our state legislatures, I suggest that there be a lead agency for all three of the federal agencies and lead agency for all of the state agencies. And it just wasn't going to be a process that has so many with overlapping requirements. Um, I people with government. And this is a clear example of it. And I wonder if there's any interest in out and making a suggestion for some kind of legislation that could make this go a little faster and more efficiently. In a perfect hey, world. Hey, I Jim, agree. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Me too. So you, you, you're thinking of a tripartite or yeah. joint powers <laughs> agreement for this, something like that, to work together as a team and then I conciliatory manner to make this happen. I I think that would be a wonderful <laughs> concept, but I'm not as op optimistic about that, you know, as you might be. And my feeling is we've waited this long to do this, but now that we've got some some stuff that we can really stop moving toward, we should just get on with it because I think anything else might serve to detract us or or move us astray from that goal. I mean, that's my personal opinion, so. That's well, yeah, 
I, I, I agree in a perfect world, it'd be, be wonderful, but I know in the past we've reached out to our, our legislators and they wouldn't give us the time of day. I'm specifically thinking of Jackie Spear, wouldn't give us a time of day when it came to uh, permitting through the Coastal Commission. Um, Pardon me, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we stop and wait for a reply on that suggestion. What I'm saying is that in parallel with us going forward with, obviously we don't really have any other choice, uh, we could still write a letter to our Congress, to our state representatives, complaining about the complexity of this process. Uh, this is a problem that won't get fixed if they don't know it exists. I mean, they don't know it exists unless they us occasionally complain. Of course, we're going to go forward. I'm, I'm certainly in favor of going forward. And I'll even move that we accept this proposal and go forward with it. That a motion? I'm, <laughs> no. I'm wondering. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, if Director Larimer might be willing to draft a letter that we could review and decide if we support it, and and decide if we want to mail it, you know, in parallel. Absolutely. That's kind of what I was thinking too. I, I don't. I wouldn't really want to task staff with this, but if Jim, you you want to put something together. Um, it, it couldn't hurt, and I just think our legislators should know the roadblocks that mm -hmm. they create for us, providing water for their citizenry. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll be glad to do it. I think the staff should review it. I think that um, you know, it's going to be a very long letter. I mean, the problem is pretty obvious when you realize, my gosh, there are six approvals about the very same thing. And I would certainly include we're doing our part to take the pressure off the Tuolumne. Um, th this plays into the Bay, the Bay Delta. Well, if you want to I add would, a paragraph to that effect. I would suggest, Jim, that it'd be good for you to do that. You're very articulate and quite, no, you're, you're very precise in the way you do things, but I would keep it short, shorter rather than longer. I think the longer it gets, the less attention it will get. And the shorter and sweeter, and less is more, that's my philosophy. And I'm sure you could get it into a concise enough package that it would hit hard. <laughs> and you could get it read quickly and understand it. That's my opinion. So go well, for it. Wrapped up something and send it to you for approval. Well, to everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Send all, thanks. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Jim. Okay, where were we? We do need a motion for that. Yeah, and what was the dollar amount? 110,000. Okay, oh, the 28 was under the, so it was just the one, yeah. the, the okay. 28 came under the authority. Okay, um, we have a motion, please. I'll recommend it. Uh, I recommend that we authorize the general uh, manager to execute an amendment to the professional services agreement with analytic environmental services, yes, for environmental consulting services for the Deniston San Vincente water supply project, is not to exceed $110,000. I'll second that. Joanne, please. Yes. Director Coverdale. Aye. Director Feldman. Yes. Director Larmer. Yes. Vice President Reynolds. Yes. President Michelson. Yes. Uh, question Thank for Pat. In this letter generation, should the letter be generated to staff to Mary? And given that, should Mary then send it to each of us directly? Or I'm wondering about the Brown Act stuff again, you know how that works. So is she responsible to get it to each of us individually so that we're not all on the same distance? You understand? Yeah, great question. I understood what was gonna happen was Director Larimer was actually gonna write a letter that would be distributed, but would be would come back to the board for some sort of approval. And so there'd be no discussion about it outside of a public meeting. And I think that's a good suggestion. Oh, the next meeting. Jim I send it to, meeting. to okay. your general manager and your general manager okay. can distribute it and then it would be on the agenda. Just check it. So this will happen going forward. That's your yeah, great, great comment. Okay, good. Thank, thank you. Uh, okay, emergency water main replacement project. Who's, who's gonna, Jim, is that gonna be yours? <laughs> It's me again. Okay, good guess. Um, so uh, Garcia, basically west of railroad. Um, I think you've seen the leak reports uh, in the last four months. We've had three leaks recently, um, just a few weeks ago. Um, historically, it's had three other leaks. 
Um, the holes in the cast iron have been small to quite large. Uh, guys are kind of tired of going out there and disrupting the neighborhood. The neighborhood's been very patient with us, but I think this water main's trying to tell us something. So we're requesting that you uh, will waive the uh, competitive bidding requirements uh, per resolution 2016-09, that contracting on sole shore basis with the Andrini brothers for the replacement of the six inch water main. It's 400 feet long. Uh, you'll see an exhibit on, as well as the bid from Andrini and the quote for parts. Um, Andrini's bid it for $90,403. The district would like to buy parts to save the markup on the parts. We've done that on numerous times with Andrini. Um, and uh, we'd like to do this as soon as possible. Um, we're not sure if it's gonna turn into a disaster, but three times in four months is uh, a pattern, I think. Well, plus or minus minus parts will be? 261 a foot with parts, sorry? Oh, okay, well you just answered, you answered my question. I was gonna do the math, but you did it for me. Okay, thank you. 261 Change, a foot. sorry, I'm getting a little bit of... Uh, you just did the math for me, 261 a foot, including parts. Yes. Okay, okay. And, yeah, and we're not sure if the soils are a little bit hot out there based on what we've seen on the pipe. So we've decided we'd like to put C900 in there. Is that under pavement? Yes. Well, that's a good price then. Very. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the only the only kind of exception is we're going to put in C900 uh, just so we don't end up doing this later in case there is hot soil out there. All right, I'm seeing thumbs up. Uh, let, let, can I have that in a form no, of a motion? I have a question. Oh, Chris, okay. I have a question. For, Please. So um, if you look at this, this is a 400 foot dead end. And what was put in originally was a blow off, which is typically a two inch outlet in a valve box in the street. So to service that, you have to lay down in the street and try and thread in a two inch riser, uh, get the valve to work, which it often doesn't. And then you can dump water out a two inch line. But it's a six inch pipe, which will never get flushing velocities out of a two inch outlet. If you look at the price breakdown from what Andrini priced us, they're putting a hydrant in, including repairing the sidewalk for six grand and change. And they're putting a blow off in for four grand and change. I would like to suggest that we spend two grand extra and put hydrant at the end of the cul-de-sac instead of a two inch blow off. A hydrant will give us a four inch outlet and we can actually flush that main in the future instead of laying in the street, hoping that we can get the two inch blow off to connect and work. It's two grand. I'm like, it's a $90,000 job. We spend two grand and we do it right. We save two grand and we end up with a 1960s vintage crafty <laughs> piping. Uh, Director Reynolds, we can look into that. Um, Coastside Fire likes, uh, they like the hydrants on the corners of the intersections. But you're giving them one on the, you, you have it there. You're giving it to them on the corner. I'm just replacing the blowout with a hydrant. So, and it's our water system, not the fire department. So we put the hydrant where it is on the corner, where you show it, that's the correct place for it. But at the end of the cul-de-sac, instead of a stupid two inch blow off, we have a, a fire hydrant which we can use to flush the main. I don't care if the fire department never uses it. Don't tell them about it, but I want to flush there. Well, understood. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think that was well understood. Um, okay. Don't, don't we have a whole barn full of hydrants? Yeah. Okay, with that, what do you guys say? Oh, I'll make a motion. We approve it, noting my my uh, request <laughs> to consider putting in a hydrant. Can I do that? Is that Duly legal? Noted. Duly noted. I'll second that. Okay. And so to, cl to clarify, <laughs> to clarify, <laughs> the you. motion is the staff recommendation that's in your report that uh, waives the competitive bidding requirements uh, that are in your resolution, contracting on a sole source basis with Andrini Brothers to do the work. 
and then the amount needs to be adjusted. And I don't know how you want to adjust the amount, but maybe an amount not to exceed $95,000 to at least get this additional work because it's going to be more than the 90,000 based on what Director Reynolds said. So I think you need to adjust the amount and I'm not too sure how to do that. Well, let's add five grand and make it an easy, easy hundred grand and say we authorize not to exceed a hundred grand to put in uh, for this uh, line. So that would be, that would be an extra 10,000 based on what's in the staff report. No, it says 95. Oh, sorry. I've got 95,000 in the, in the uh, 40 more. for pricing. More. In the, uh, Plus parts. We already bought the hydrant. Cost. Cost Director Reynolds, would you would you uh, consider a larger port blow off rather than a whole hydrant since hmm. we have one on the corner? You want to put a four inch blow off in? It's better than a hydrant, I think, in this case. Where are you going to put it? Can we talk about it at the facilities committee and move on? Yep. Okay. All right. I'll make a motion for this. Uh, I don't have where where to read it. So. Good job. Good job, James. Defusing all this and getting us back on track. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. <laughs> I'll I'll make a recommendation that we determine the waiving the competitive bidding requirements of resolution 2016-9. Do I have to read the whole thing? No, I did. If you can just put in the if you can just put in the dollar amount, that would be helpful. Oh, okay. So it says here ninety thousand and four hundred and three. That's it. How come Mandrini's bid is ninety five thousand? No, it says ninety thousand. Request for pricing right here. Garcia Ab replacement total price ninety five thousand eight hundred and three dollars. Um, is there a typo here? No. How'd you get that? I My picked it out of the binder. You're only the vice president. Oh, sorry. So that's why I said just add five grand and it makes it a hundred grand and then we're good. Well, yeah, I mean, Pat, I don't see how I can approve the amendment for 90,000 when Andrini's request for pricing is 95,803. Um, can I just make it a hundred grand? Sure. How about for an let's amount that you can see a hundred thousand? Yeah. All right. Let's do that. All right. So I suggest we repair the main on Garcia as an emergency repair, not to exceed a hundred thousand dollars. Can I explain before you guys vote, just so you guys understand? <laughs> We got sure. we got two quote we got two quotes from Andrini that miscounted the services. We should have put in a quote that was ninety thousand, and the wrong quote got in there. That's my fault. I shouldn't have left it in the folder for people to get to. So there's only eleven services, not fourteen services. The Andrini bid is actually ninety thousand. That's the price okay. delta. There. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. okay. Well, All right. Well, let's. Yeah, let's yeah. Use Let's use the extra money to put in a hydrant or a four inch blow off. You and I can figure it out offline. And meanwhile, don't spend more than a hundred grand. Sounds good. Thank you. I need Are, you a snack. Are you happy with that, Patrick? Yes. Okay. okay so we, need, we need a second. Yes, we yeah, need we'll a second. Well, I'll speak up at once. I'll second it then. Okay. Second it. Ma'am, please. Yes, Director Coverdell. Now was that a hundred thousand? It was ninety-five. Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay, Director Feldman. Yes. Director Larmer. <laughs> Director Larmer. <laughs> Are you there, Jim? Jim, you're going to turn off your no. mute. Jim, you're on mute. I said yes, but I think it should be 95,000. Oh no. I'll take the yes. Vice President Reynolds? Yes. President Michelson? Yes. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. Hey. Let's see you, Mary. Six yes, this is me. 
Okay. Um, so I'm actually going to share my uh, screen for a bit. Not too long, so because then we'll get back to seeing each other. Um, So uh, I wanted to reintroduce the 2020, 2021 budget, draft budget. Uh, at the February uh, 2020 board meeting, uh, we presented a draft fiscal year um, budget. Um, but since February, we've had two very significant changes. Um, one being COVID-19, and our sheltering in place. And our other change has been uh, the lack of um, rainfall on our local watersheds, um, with the exception of our little bit of rain last night. Uh, so uh, in terms of um, you know, with uh, COVID-19, uh, with sheltering in place, um, we, uh, we have seen a significant impact on our commercial and visiting uh, visitor serving um, businesses. And um, just in, you know, we only have one month of data. So, um, but we are seeing a significant drop in revenue. We know that our restaurants and our hotels aren't, you know, aren't in doing much business. Um, so for the, um, for the month of April, uh, year over year, we had a 54% decline in um, revenue in those categories, um, which equates to about 76,000 gross revenue or 50,000 net after you can take out the water cost. Uh, so, you know, we are very concerned that we're going to continue this uh, decline. Uh, we will, um, so what, you know, as we look at a, a budget going into next year, right now I was factoring in um, a 30% decline in these categories. Uh, it will, you know, at this point, you know, we don't know. We need to watch this, and we can watch it again in June before we approve a budget. But, you know, I wanted to make everyone aware of this significant decline in revenue. Uh, and then take into account we, um, that we also had a, a decline in revenue with the loss of uh, basically flowers. Um, you know, they have had some business. Um, in their in this in their uh, on their fields, but it's not making up, you know, for what Bay City Flowers used to do. Uh, the other issue is our lack of rainfall. Um, we, um, you know, we've been looking at what we'll be able to get out of our local sources in the net, um, and right now we're uh, figuring that we're only going to be able to use Deniston as a source. Um, into June, um, and we'll probably not be able to use Deniston again until December, which is, you know, which is a, a big issue for us. I mean, if you if you look at um, this past year uh, with the rainfall in last year spring, we had amazing rainfall, uh, and we we have a, the rainfall that we've seen this year. It's um, uh, only 2013-2014 uh, had lower rainfall. Right. So, you know, at this you know, point in time, we're losing our local source water. Um, we're also being limited right now on what we're going to be able to get from Pilocetus Reservoir. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we can maybe get, you know, 500 gallons a minute. Uh, it, we, it, we need to be able to bank some of the water in the reservoir. The reservoir is low. And so we're working with SFPUC to figure out how much water we can take. But most of our water is going to be coming from Crystal Springs, which means you know, much higher electricity costs as well. So we have those two factors. Um, we also then have some other factors, which include our um, possible bad debt uh, by not being able to have shutoffs and uh, so, and with the economic situation that we have, um, uh, you know, in our country, in our community. 
Uh, and I, you know, I, I do want to show um, that was something I, you know, I pulled out just for for, uh, you know, for showing what we're seeing with our accounts receivable. Um, this, you know, what I did is I took a point in time today, you know, being the 12th of the month. And so as of today, we had 90,000 um, past, uh, past due. Uh, if you look at back in February and March, we were down in the 20,000s. So, you know, we are seeing uh, some slowing on payments, um, whether, whether or not these become actual bad debt, we are, you know, not sure. I mean, I will tell you that at this point, uh, I was reading a, a um, report today, Raftelis consultants put out, um, estimating that we'll, we'll see bad debt jumps to 6% of our revenue. I hope not, because that would mean $700,000 worth of bad debt. Um, so, but this is just something that we, you know, we just need to watch very uh, closely. Um, we have um, actually gone, um, uh, we we do set up payment plans with our customers. Uh, so you know, at this point, we have ten plans. Um, normally, we would maybe have three or four plans um, going um, on at uh, in our normal times. Uh, but we're seeing you know we're seeing more more plans, um, which is good. So you know our um, and we offer plans up to paying the balance over twelve months. Uh, you know, at this point, what we're seeing, you know, as of today, we had 316 residential accounts that were past due and, and uh, 54 accounts that uh, were, uh, you know, non-residential accounts. So it's just something we're, we're, we're going to be watching you know, our aging very carefully and just seeing the trends of, of you know, what we're going to, you know, what we might see in bad debt. 90 is the total outstanding for for four months, it's not for a month. This no, is not but, yeah, that's for four months, or, or, or greater, greater than. Um, you know, it's it's not current. So anything that's uh, so. It's uh, ninety total at this point. Ninety total at this point. Yeah, you've got ten plans, five thousand of the ninety. Excuse me, I'm sorry. You've got ten plans, ten payment plans set up, yeah, which right. would for my about 5,000 of the 90. Correct. Okay, no, I'm just trying to understand. Okay. Yeah. We expected this and and uh, maybe not, I don't know at this rate, but it's, we knew this was gonna be difficult. And um, one of the reasons that we, um, well, that's why they have the uh, can't shut water off rules now that the state has implemented, et cetera, because it was clear this would start happening. Okay, I mean, that's the information and this may continue is what you're saying until in the foreseeable future. And I'll plan to record on this, you know, number every month and what well, maybe do it in a little bit different format, yeah. but I, mm -hmm. it just is something that we, we need to be watching closely. No, I agree. So can you estimate what this means in terms of the total budget if you add all of these three sources together of loss? Well, what, um, and that gets to the next uh, slide. Um, you know, basically on our, you know, with, I, I have a comparison of uh, what I'm thinking about for a, a draft budget for 2021 versus our, you know, what was approved uh, for 2019-20. Um, what we, you know, what we we're looking at at our draft budget in February was probably closer to what the 2019-20 budget looks like. So basically what it is, is to the, you know, to the bottom line contribution to CIP and re reserves, it's about a million dollar um, reduction. Um, so uh, with the, it, between the reduced revenue and the increased expenses. Um, with this, I included a hundred thousand of bad debt. But again, that's something that's going to be, you know, it's you know, something we're, we're, we'll need to watch. So you're estimating that the cost of uh, running uh, from Crystal Springs till December is three hundred thousand dollars for the, on a yearly basis. Well, we um, and that goes back to our you know some of our expenses. So we we have um, uh, we will over um, if if we look at the the expenses actually we, the 2019 2020 had uh, the budget. 
we've, we've planned 611 and we've, we've actually been saving money on electricity, but now we're gonna, we are gonna be spending more on, you know, on electricity. Um, these numbers, uh, and, and also in terms of water purchases, um, if we look at, uh, you know, I have uh, 320,000 higher, but realize that that's on a reduced volume of water, um, just because we're not going to get, we're not going to get the water from our local sources. You know, we're, we're basically going to be relying on Crystal Springs, you know, say, pretty much till December. But, but to be perfectly clear, you're saying that the water purchase line on this chart and the electricity line on this chart together will be incremented by $300,000? Um, no, no, this is what I'm saying. I've already adjusted the budgets. I've already calculated based on our usage. So between, so actually what, what's happening is between the lower, um, uh, it, um, we have lower revenue and higher costs. We're getting to the, a, a, a change of a million dollars. So that's everything that $25,000 election expense is really causing the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, certainly oh. what I'd like to do is to have a finance committee meeting, be, you know, before the next um, board meeting, right. um, where we can go over these numbers, um, a little, Latest it, numbers yeah. you know, closer, a little bit more closely, so we can, so. Right now, we're a million lower than we had uh, projected in revenue, basically. Right. Think, and then the capital expenditure uh, plan won't have as much because the reserves won't be as much uh, as we plan. With the, the accrual, our, our, our yeah. asset growth, the reserves won't be as high this yeah. year. At this point, given our present way of charging, et cetera, I mean, our present revenue rate schedule, et cetera. There's some thing to be said in a positive manner for the fact that we decided at a previous meeting to hold off on showing our cards in terms of our rate increases, et cetera, because we weren't clear on how badly things might you know, happen and we wouldn't know all the information before we made the call. So this is a step that says it was the right thing that we did to hold off a bit until we had more information and saw where things were going so we could plan accordingly going forward in terms of our future budget rate increases, et cetera. So I feel like, we did the right thing on that basis for the, for the moment, based on what you're saying. But can, I, can I ask for one more piece of clarification? So at the beginning of this meeting, Ken reviewed the, uh, the, the status of the budget. And I thought what I heard was that we had 9 million in reserve and expected to spend about 6 million of it, leaving three. Yeah. And now this adds, um, uh, decrements that $3 million of reserve by $1 million. Is that right? Am I well, okay. Um, that one, that was our capital budget. So the, um, I, we're, we're talking different numbers, although they feed into each other. I, you know, I think it would make more sense if we look at the chart I have up right now. Uh, what we have is... Uh, you know, right now we have, you know, cash reserves in the bank, um, uh, 8.9 million. Um, uh, and then we, so, you know, that's, you know, what we're looking at right now. And then in terms of open capital improvement projects, which include the projects that you, we spoke about um, um, earlier that you, uh, today that you approved, we have about 1.2 million. This is, you know, plus or minus. So, um, estimated at the end of June, uh, we're going to have about 7.7 .7 million in the bank. Uh, if we look at then our um, what we're going to be doing with our uh, with our uh, 2021 O&M budget, uh, we would uh, we would have um, about 2.9 million going to CIP and reserves. So adding to that cash reserves number, but then 
if we um, think about if we're going to spend $5 million next year on capital, we will, our cash reserves by the end of June 2021 would go down to 5.4 million, which puts us at, um, at, you know, as opposed to the 8.8 .8 million, that's the targeted cash reserve number for um, June 30th, uh, 2021, you know, per our RAPTELUS analysis. So at the end of the day, if we go for the 5 million next year in capital, then that would cause us to get well below the 7.8 that we had always looked at as, uh, you know, comfortable reserves. So it sounds like, as you have suggested in the past, that we need to look at the capital plan going forward and decide whether there are things we have to start looking at in terms of uh, rescheduling and some uh, reduction in that number to, you know, uh, plan for the lower reserves. I mean, that's what we said we were thinking about doing as a result of what we thought was happening, unless I'm not adequately articulating what we said in the past. So I think the finance committee has to look at this based on the numbers you generated, but the capital project folks have to look and see what that means for the capital plan, because what we planned the five million per year for, for the number of years may be a little rich in the next year or two. Yeah. Yeah, how, much, I, how much of the capital improvement uh, spending budget at 5.15 uh, million includes these new unforeseen uh, you know, numbers in newness and in the tanks? Is it that in the 5 million per year spending? Yeah. Um, Yes, uh, so we came up with uh, a, a CIP of 25 um, million, roughly, um, which averaging out gets you know, for the 5 million, so 25 million over the five years. Um, I will say, though, that uh, we have some better, we're getting some better numbers. Actually, we're, um, we have two meetings um, in the upcoming few days with HDR, who could who um, they're working on the um, Nunes project. Uh, we are also meeting on our tanks. So uh, we hope to have some better numbers that we can um, sit down and talk to the facilities committee about later this month as well. So uh, anyway, so, but that, that's, you know, this average is with uh, the 5 million as part of this average of, you know, 25 million over the five years. So is any of the money anticipated at Nunes or the tanks in that 25 million? Uh, yes. There are placeholders. There are placeholders. And, and I, it, yes. What kind of placeholders on those two numbers? Okay, so the, uh, on Nunes, um, we had 7 million in over, a couple years. So uh, I frankly, that number looks pretty good right now, but we still need to uh, meet with HDR uh, on that number. Um, we have numbers, um, we have some money um, in for tanks uh, and we need to juggle around what, you know, the tank plan as to what we would do first. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking that the priority is uh, dealing with the um, Half Moon Bay uh, tanks up at Nunes um, eventually, I mean, in the, within the five year time frame. Um, but we need to regroup on that. Oh, great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so if you look at, you know, what we we're thinking about, um, you know, back uh, a few months ago, you know, we, you know, the, the number that would be, um, coming, you know, as a result of, would be, you know, from the 2020 to 2021 period, again, we're, we're looking at more like a, a, a 3.9 million um, contribution to CIP and reserves in next year's budget. Uh, so, uh, and before a rate increase. So just, you know, to put that into perspective of, of what, what we're thinking about a few months ago. More rate increase, right? 
Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, all of these numbers are without a rate increase. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I will, I will say that we are looking at what might be available for possible stimulus funding. Uh, this month, uh, Bosca submitted some projects to Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and we participated in this submittal. And I put in four shovel-ready projects um, to Bosca. But this is really, you know, an attempt for Silicon Valley Leadership Group to, you know, to look to get the votes in for trying to get stimulus money um, for public works. Uh, I, I've actually participated in a few uh, uh, WebExes in the last week or so uh, with supposed experts in funding. So, you know, we are waiting to see what, what the um, federal government and the state government is going to do with the, like, you know, with, um, with funding. You know, most of these these funding arrangements would be probably lower interest. Um, some may be grants, but are limited. You know, there are limitations on the grants. Uh, and with any stimulus funding, you know, they are looking for shovel-ready pro uh, projects where we don't have any environmental issues, and the permits are already, already obtained. So we have a few of these projects, but. Uh, you know, it's a question also of how, you know, if, if something could be available even on Nunes, you know, we could, you know, I think, you know, we could be done with a design in the next six months or so. Um, uh, if, you know, if that, but I will say uh, likelihood is limited on getting this funding, but I'm just, you know, throwing it out that we are looking at options. Ask a question. Yes. Could you go back to the slide with the numbers? So, no. Slide six. Slide six. So, you're showing that our target was eight seven million dollars. This is a target that the uh, the consultants recommended, and you're sh and that's a three million dollar difference between where you think we're going to be. And we're talking about 14 months from now. Is that right? Correct. So how does about a million dollar a year loss turn into a $3 million difference? I'm confused by that. I don't see where the extra $2 million went. Uh, the eight, eight was um, a target. So when we were looking at numbers um, a couple months ago, uh, the uh, projected cash reserves would be, um, you know, first of all, you would have a million dollars more just because of having, you know, more revenue and um, and uh, costs, you know, fewer. Uh, Cost. So, you know, that we have that differential. Plus, we were looking at doing a, um, a, a rate increase that would not get us up to the target for this year, but would get us closer to the target. Uh, so, we would be looking at, um, you know, um, over a five year period when you're looking at adjustments, you're, you're getting up, um, you're, you're, closing in on the target. Yeah, but so shouldn't we be looking at not where we want to be, but where we are likely to be? And that, I mean, this this makes this difference look really large, and it's really not that big. Because that 8-7 wasn't really where we were going to be anyway. It was where we wanted to be, not where we could get. And so, um, I think we need to really stick closer to the to the actuals here and, and, and less uh, about what we would like uh, to, to get a good picture of what's going on here. So you're expecting to lose about a million dollars plus. Um, and we could probably absorb that. Uh, that's presumably what these emergency reserves are for. And this is certainly an emergency. But you know, we, uh, 
you know, we need to plan whether we need to go forward with a, with a rate increase or not based on, you know, what's likely to happen in the next year and a half or two years. So I think we need numbers that are really, you know, pretty close to what we could actually get, not what we would like to get. Oh. The work Raph Ellis did was based on what we knew at the time that he was in the process of preparing this. The eight million eight eight five was what we had in reserves. The changes in what we're earning, and also the uh, the lack of getting the reserve number that we wanted for this year is new information. The ninth committee is going to meet, I assume, with Mary this month and go over the latest and greatest. As is the capital committee to see what that looks like, and then next month. April, June, we'll come back with more information as we decide how we're going to approach next year's budget. I don't think that we have the information quite yet uh, that we can say any of this is either good or bad, and whether or not it's something that's going to forestall us from having a rate increase is still something we have to understand because I think at best we may delay the increase, but there'll be something at some point because I think the reserve will uh, deteriorate over time. And uh, we fought hard over the last five years to get it. And I certainly would expect the finance committee to be using their best judgment to take a look and make the right recommendations to staff, et cetera, or staff you know, to work with us to come up with the right answer. So that's, I, I think you're presenting the information as you know it today, is that correct, Mary? And what we know, we haven't sent Raph Tellus back to do another analysis. So right now, I think what you're saying is we're down a mill based on what we had thought we were going to have, and it may get worse, and now we're going to have to deal with that as we get moving forward, if I'm not mistaken what you're saying. And that may all play into our rate increase going forward. Yeah, okay. uh, th thanks for your input, Bob, and I agree. The uh, Finance Committee does uh, need to take a look at this. Numbers are developing, yes. and this will be a topic of discussion for the next few months, how do we move forward on a rate increase? Right now it's on hold. Uh, information is developing. Um, a month from now we'll know, we'll, I'm sure we'll see the, the bad debt number going up, um, pumping costs go, going up from, um, from Crystal Springs, uh, water purchases. Right, right. This, is, this is an evolving scenario. The ball is getting a little clearer than it was last month, but it's gonna evolve over the next few months. So this is all good information. Uh, but let's let the uh, finance committee take a look at it before our next meeting. Thank you. I, for one, I'm very happy we have the reserve that we accumulated, frankly. I think it's come to pass that it was the right move and the right, the right policy for us to generate the reserve we did. And it gives us a little uh, leverage, a little uh, leeway for future uh, issues. So I'm, I'm, I think we have all done the right thing over the last years to manage this and to uh, make it happen. Good. Thank you. And this was just an informational item, so we could move to the next one. Yes. Okay. Please. Uh, please. Item G. Okay. So uh, this item uh, came about by re a request from two of the uh, district's directors um, to put uh, this item on the agenda to talk about the um, economic um, impact to the Coastside County Water District customers. Uh, due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Uh, you know, we will say with this, um, we also uh, wanted to share um, Governor Newsom's executive order, um, which we included in the board packet, which uh, prohibits shut off of, of water to our customers. Uh, we also included the uh, State Water Resources Control Board's uh, recommendations on how to, you know, on best practices for dealing with not being able to shut off um, the water. So um, we included those as well. Uh, so I will um, let us know if, if we could answer questions, but this is a time for your discussion. If I could just, um, if I could just kind of chime in and just uh, kind of help set the framework as well. Um, an another way to look at this is what protections are in place for the district's customers. If you look at the documents that were included in your agenda packet and even go back one step further to 
SB 998, which we adopted a policy to implement SB 998, which, which provided greater protections for residential customers for non-payment notice provisions and not, a number of other statutory provisions. You start there and then you look at the governor's executive order, which prohibits shutoffs. Um, what, what the order does not do is it doesn't eliminate the obligation to pay. Um, it doesn't prevent the district from charging the customer for service that it's providing. And it doesn't reduce the amount that the customer owes the district, but it says uh, in this pandemic, there will be no water, water shutoff terminations. And then the governor left some open questions and said, and we'll look for the State Water Resources Control Board to provide some guidance. And that guidance issued was about was issued about a month later. And that's also in your agenda packet. And those the guideline the guidance guidelines and best practices, um, they really talk about communications and outreach, uh, payment plan options, um, considering waiving late fees, which the district has already done. Um, and tracking uh, payment plans and delinquencies and using reserve funds to cover these things. And so Mary just went over a bunch of that stuff as well. So I just wanted to put that framework and there's two, you know, uh, you know, how is this impacting the customers? Certainly there's impacts to the customers. What protections are in place? And there's a number of protections that are already in place. So I just wanted to provide that framework as you continue to discuss this. And I'm sure you'll have questions for both uh, your general manager and I. Okay, that said, questions? Okay. Jim? Uh, Bob's got to say. The, the directors had, uh, two, two folks had requested an agenda item with their ideas they had about what we should do, other than what we have done, or we are bound to do by the legislation what we already have in place. I was just interested to know if there was, you know, something. We let, let, let's let Jim uh, tell us. I can't tell you because I don't know the answer, but I can ask some questions. Um, I noticed in the best practice document, there were uh, one, one of the recommendations was to use, to, to use our reserves to offset some of these losses. Uh, at least on a temporary basis. Obviously, if, if people have the ability to pay even long term, we want to recover the unpaid bills of, of, of con continuing customers and not have to write them off. I'm, I'm sure most people want to pay their bills when they're able. Um, <clears throat> and we certainly don't want to uh, not be, be unwilling to collect them. But I also noticed in the best practices that there is a statement about augmenting existing rate assistance programs. What is a rate assistance program? Does this mean that we can charge differential rates on, a, on the ability to pay? So it's a, it's a great question. Um, the framework for, for rates are Proposition 218. And we've had lots of discussions about the ability to have uh, lower rates for different classes of customers. And the law has not changed in that regard. So the answer for having deferential rates um, for certain classes of customer, that law has not yet changed. So the answer to that question is no. Um, the rate assistance programs, um, I don't know specifically what they're referring to, but I do know about a number of rate assistance programs. Um, so I do know um, that some of the electric utilities and some of the cities have rate assistance programs. PG&E, for example, has uh, rate assistance programs, but they are governed by different statutes. Um, I can also tell you that another county water district um, that I happen to serve as general counsel for does have a rate assistance program. Um, it's called the, uh, uh, the Help on Tap program. And the way they have structured it is that they use certain uh, non, what they call non-revenue, non-water rate funds to actually fund the program and to provide a rebate to the service charge for certain uh, low-income customers that qualify and they have an eligibility requirement. Um, so that's the one water agency. And there's a few other water agencies that have things like that, but it's more common in cities and, um, and for PG&E and other utilities, for example. Well, <clears throat> I would like to learn a lot more about that and learn what what the boundary conditions are and how far we can go and what the limits are. 
And I'd be happy to talk with you about that because there are limits, there are risks, um, and we could certainly talk about those. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Um, one of the things that um, was discussed in a conversation was the idea that we, um, by helping local business, we could encourage uh, people to not feel the same impact uh, of the uh, COVID-19. So what would that mean? Uh, expediting local projects. But I think we've done that tonight. We've authorized, I don't know, it seems like seven or eight hundred million dollars worth of work uh, in our local community. I think that getting people back to work, getting the economy going again is a positive uh, thing that we can do as a district. You know, we're looking at some, some uh, cash flow deficits that are serious, but we also know that we're probably in one of the best borrowing environments that we've been in a long time. You know, we're starting to see interest rates maybe even lower than the 3% or, you know, 3.5% that we are seeing for borrowing for projects. And so if there were federal funds or state funds, you know, at a 1% rate, you know, maybe the idea actually is to borrow mo more money now and, you know, pick up or speed up our projects. Because a lot of the contractors that are doing our work are local contractors are employing local people. And I think that that's in the spirit of, of supporting the, the economy going forward, getting the economy going again. But I think we might reap a benefit from that. Um, you know, it seems like, I think people are really concerned that prices may be high right now, but I honestly believe that prices for construction are gonna come down. I think people are gonna come out of this and they're gonna to wanna to get to work. They're gonna to wanna to get their companies rolling. I'm disappointed that we didn't get multiple bids on a couple of the projects that we're looking at. But I think that as we get these projects going that we might wanna expedite uh, some of the expenditures. So that was an idea. But the discussion was really about uh, how can we as a district help support the local economy, the local uh, environment that we live in. That was the discussion. And uh, I think it's an interesting concept. You know, we're $3 million short of where we wanna be. So I don't really think it's, we're a big charity that can give money away. It's, I think that's ludicrous, right? But, uh, but there may be things that we can do to, um, just to support the local people. Um, that was an idea. Well, back to the envelope math is we just authorized over $900,000 tonight um, to lo local contractors. So we certainly are, are, are doing, doing our part here. And Bob? Um, the, um, you mentioned, Ken, 700 million. It was close, but it was like 900,000. <laughs> it was it's a slip of the tongue. I meant, I meant 700,000, sorry. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I was going to say, just in case somebody got the wrong end. Seven eight hundred. No, that's okay. We're doing a lot of a lot of stuff. Um, as to helping the public and the customers, the thing that comes to mind to me as one of the things we've done. I mean, although it may not have been something that we thought about in that line, was simply that we delayed, we waived, we deferred doing anything with the rate that we now have for another three months at least. So we have, in essence, kept the 4% rate that we have for another three months. And I think that we have shown right at the, out of the gate that we were concerned and we wanted to try to do something for the public, the customers. And I feel good about that because I think we made that effort more than some other agencies have been able to make and other agencies are planning to make. So we did do a little of that. And maybe it's not as much as we could, but we did it and I think that's, something we have to be positive about. Going forward, as we see how the numbers look, as we see what's going on, maybe we can do some things to look at timing again. I don't know. But for us to be able to do anything, as Pat mentioned, that are based on unfunded, you know, un revenue not associated with water sales, there's nothing there really. There never has been that much. And we've not had that option in the past. I don't see we'll have any game. 
if we're not going to shut people's water off and we're going to carry their debt for a while longer, then we're doing all we can based on what the strictures are to us at this point. I would assume we'll hold those debts for the future and not write them off unless, you know, people leave town or do other things. But we certainly can look at how long we can do that for while using our reserves on the way. So that's, I don't know, I felt good that we've done something to me that was a positive factor at this point. And I would like to think of others, but I'm not sure anything is in our control as much as this was. Thank you. Thank you. And from what I'm reading, everyone else is, um, other districts are raising their rates. Uh, I've seen that in the water world. Uh, city of Half Moon Bay, 23% rate increase for, for sewer fees for right now, and we're at zero. Um, I think we definitely are doing a community service here about by holding up at, at zero as others are raising their rates. So I'm pretty proud of what we're doing here. And thanks for illuminating that. Uh, um, and I'm seeing, Glenn, did you have something to say? No, okay, then then Jim. Jim. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, comment on, uh, make, uh, sort of underscore something that Ken said. Uh, we have a lot of businesses in this community that have been really impacted uh, badly by this COVID-19, the hotels and the restaurants. And those are our, our major employers in this community. And right now there's really not much we can do to assist them. But we could in the future when, they're, when the, the business starts to come back, we could offer them a reduced rate for some period of time. We're sort of doing that already, but we could extend it. Uh, we could go ahead with a rate increase, but we could decide to only implement it after so many months uh, because they're gonna need some help. Because if we don't help them, we're gonna lose some of those businesses. And that's gonna cost us in the long run too because we're looking at revenue that they generate. And if they're not here, they won't generate it. So it'll never come back. So we need to really think about policies that we can implement that not only help our, our customers, some of whom are employers, uh, but that will essentially assure our business long-term too. And so we're not, by helping them, we're actually helping ourselves. So um, I think we have to think about this very clearly and carefully as we go forward. And it really is about rates and it really is about when we increase those rates and how we, how we deal with it. I mean, we could do things, for example, like put everybody on the lowest tier rate for some period of time. Uh, that would be helpful. It would help them recover some of their losses. Um, but I don't know what it does for us. It has to be balanced against the long-term gain and the long-term cost. I, I, I personally don't feel it's really the job of CCWD to, to pick winners here. Um, I, I don't, I don't, from, from my perspective, that's a, that's a non-starter. Um, we have capital improvement, $25 million of capital improvement programs to implement within the next five years. We need the revenue to do it. Our mandate is to serve safe and reliable source of water. And we need the funds to do that. And that, that, is, that is why we are here today to serve our customers with water and we need the infrastructure to do it. And we need revenue to pay for those projects. And anyone else? Well, I, I just wanna say that I really appreciate vetting the discussion. I think that uh, one of the things that's nice about having person to person meetings is we get a little bit more contact. And I think that some of the contact is really an advantage in that you know, all of us are trying to look for solutions and answers. You know, how can we improve, um, how can we improve our customers, our uh, local citizens' lives? And uh, so I appreciate vetting it. I appreciate the time. Thank you. I, I think that, that we will want to watch very closely the financial status of the community as we reopen. And I do think that's going to have to be balanced against, against our budget. And if this runs for a long time, we may be burning our much more of our reserve in, in lost income, and we may not have as much reserve as we'd like to help others. Um, but I do think that it will be vital, as it's always vital, 
that we keep our, our finger on the pulse of the community and how they're doing because our job is, is to serve them and provide them water and, and that, that is directly related to finances for them and us. So I, I think that Jim has a really good point. We've got to watch it. I think Chris has a, a valid point that we cannot let the water system fail in the meantime. So we'll have to watch both those issues closely. Thank you. Uh, everyone, everyone had their piece on this? Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, it, it, in pursuing this, I just, I am a little concerned that, that legal gets, our, our, our legal bill starts starts getting getting run up and pursuing things that really aren't, aren't our, 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 our charter. So I, uh, Patrick, I appreciate the time and re research that you've put into this, but I, you know, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want you to feel as though you've been charged with, you know, researching this you know, ad, ad nauseum running up big bills. I mean, my feeling is this has been discussed. We've all ha all had our opinions. Um, but I, I'm not seeing direction for you to pursue this further unless I'm hearing, unless I'm missing something. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, I just want to kind of put the, put, put the, thank you. Put, put the brake brakes on, on legal because every dollar counts right now. Okay. Thank you. So on, on to something much more pleasant. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh, Dave, thank you. You're, you're back. <laughs> Item 6A. Mary, do you want to lead us into it? Okay, well, Joanne is going to be leaving us at the end of May, and we're all going to miss her tremendously. Um, she's been here for 23 years, um, has been a stellar employee. Um, I I, you know, and she's done a wonderful, you know, wonderful work for this board and for the district. So we want to thank her um, with a resolution. So Chris, I'll <laughs> let you take it over. Oh boy. Okay. So as president, I get to read this resolution. Resolution number 2020-01, a resolution of the board of directors of the Coastside County Water District expressing appreciation to Joanne Whelan for her 23 years of service as administrative assistant of the Coastside County Water District. Whereas Joanne Whelan, after serving as administrative assistant for Coastside County Water District for the past 23 years is retiring. And whereas in her position as administrative assistant, Joanne like Performance. No, I think I'm good. An yeah. invaluable service to the district as administrative support to the general manager and the board of directors. And whereas in her recording secretary role for the district board of directors meetings, Joanne demonstrated a consistent ability to capture the essence of the discussion of the board meetings in the meeting, meeting minutes and accurately and concisely reflect the board's intent in an understandable way. And whereas through her dedication and commitment to promoting good governance and transparency, Joanne spearheaded the district's efforts to earn the Special District Leadership Foundation's prestigious award of the Transparency Certificate of Excellence twice. And whereas her superior work ethic, integrity and administration abilities has earned her the respect and admiration of her Coastside County Water District peers. And whereas Joanne has continued to learn and take on new responsibility by earning her distribution operator cert certification and providing the cross connection and backflow program administrative services. And whereas Joanne performed her professional duties with reliability, thoroughness, while taking on the face of the district to our community, always maintaining a friendly, patient, pleasant demeanor with coworkers, customers, and public. And whereas Joanne has shared her valuable talents with the district by helping to plan outreach special events, including coordinating work sessions for the board of directors. And whereas Joanne has always been ready and willing to adapt to change in the leadership and management styles of numerous managers, and the challenges of communicating the array of information necessary to carry out the business of the district with energy and enthusiasm and above and beyond the normal call of duty. And whereas Joanne maintained and enhanced the job of an administrative assistant 
and relieve the general managers of numerous tasks, freeing them up confidently to confidently focus on the multitude of realities and responsibilities of keeping the biggest little water district in California operating smoothly and efficiently in the face of numerous challenges, including drought. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the Coastside County Water District hereby adopts this resolution of appreciation to express its sincere thanks to Joanne Whelan for her 23 years of dedication service to the Coastside County Water District and this community. Oh, I can't say pass and adopted because it hasn't been passed and adopted yet, but that is the essence of the resolution. Wow. Thank you, Joanne. And uh, Thank yeah, you. you have served under some real, real personalities here. <laughs> Total of 19 different board of director members I've worked with. Yeah. Uh, four general managers, uh, two acting general managers, four superintendents, and 19 board members. Characters all. <laughs> 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 the five best are still here. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> so thank, thank you so much. And do I have a motion? I move we approve the I'll make resolution a motion. as presented. Yep. I'll second it. Oh, Joanne, what roll call, please? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Director Cover. Wait a minute, could we have discussion? Oh, oh okay. Can I put up my hand? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Did you put in a speaker slip? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I, I'm really sorry we couldn't do this in person because uh, that would have been so much better, but uh, that's how we all feel, I think. I just did the math. Uh, Joanne's been there 23 years. She worked with me for 12. So uh, that uh, puts me on top in terms of um, uh, general managers. Right. Uh, something, uh, 140 something meetings. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, add my congratulations here. Really from the day I started with the district until the day I retired. I never had to worry about the details of organizing the board's schedule or agenda uh, or getting to the meetings or getting the directors to the meetings. If you're like me, you probably got a call from Joanne at some point saying, uh, did you know there was a meeting uh, that started a couple minutes ago? <laughs> Where are you? Uh, and I just, um, you know, one of the things in, in Joanne's resolution Consistent ability to capture the essence of the discussion at board meetings. Um, that was a constant uh, uh, tug of war between me and Joanne. She really wanted to capture the essence. I just wanted the decisions to be documented. So if uh, any time your essence wasn't captured, that was my fault and not Joanne's. Um, and just, uh, you know, I just wanted, I just really, appreciate uh, Joanne's competence, her professionalism, uh, her patience, her good humor, which we uh, tried a number of times uh, as she tried to organize us and, and uh, herd the cats. Uh, and I really want to uh, wish her the best in retirement. I know she's going to have spend time with her grandchildren as soon as we can do that under our uh, COVID-19 orders and spend some time in Oregon. And so uh, to Joanne, uh, thank you very much for your service to the district and particularly for uh, the assistance you gave me in my 12 years there. And boy, I can say I seems like I really retired at the right time. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and Joanne's uh, not too far behind. So uh, Joanne, congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. That means a lot. Thank you very much. Um, so let, let's go ahead and pass the resolution and then I'd like to hear from the other directors, please. Uh, let's see, so, Director Coverdale? Aye. Director Feldman? Never gonna happen. Not gonna <laughs> vote aye on that. I'm not letting her go. No way, if we do a quick vote <laughs> here, and although no, she'll have to stay. Isn't that true, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> all right, yes, I do it. That's all right. I'm just giving off. Um, Dr. Larmer? Yes, and I thank you, John, for your many years of service. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Reynolds? I'll approve the reservation res, uh, resolution, but also register my sadness to see you go, Joanne. 
Thank you very much. And President Michelson. Yes, and job, job well, well done. Th thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, comments? Yes, I, I'd like to make a comment. If I Please. Could. Um, Joanne, I just want to tell you, I, I think you and I are pretty much contemporaries at Coastside County Water District. I think I've been around about as many years as you have. And I've certainly watched you uh, uh, perform. That's what I uh, would compliment you uh, to the highest level for was I watched you perform and it was so many different individuals. I remember when Tony Condotti was running the district because we didn't have a general manager. Uh, what an unusual condition, but, but you created a continuity that made it feel like there was a general manager. And I think that that is, uh, that's really a skill that I don't think many people have. I think there tends to be a panic in those times when, you know, the, the uh, structure of the staff is interrupted and somehow you have to still look like there's a staff that's uh, managing and operating the district. So uh, that, that's the compliment I would give you is, is uh, just your incredible resilience in all those changes to me was fantastic to watch. And of course I got to watch you raise two wonderful sons and, and uh, you know, them to pick significant others and, you know, have families. And it's just been really great to watch watch you uh, earn this wonderful retirement. And Thank you. I can tell you that I don't know uh, really how things are gonna function as smoothly as they have under your tutelage because uh, uh, your persistence on email is unbelievable. <laughs> and, uh, so I'd just like to thank you. And I actually would like to do the inappropriate thing of giving you a big hug, but, uh, and just telling you thanks uh, from yeah, the bump. Bump. For, for all the personal, uh, um, you know, attention, respect, and just resilience. So thank you. Uh, thank you. You're going to be sorely missed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Anyone else? Well, two areas I'm, well, two areas I think were obvious to me during the 12 or so years that I've been associated with Joanne. And one was what appeared to me to be the seamless operation of the administrative side of our business which uh, always seemed to function seamlessly and with uh, very little in the way of uh, heartburn or uh, noise. And uh, I think that's credit Joanne and, and uh, her leadership of the, the administrative folks. So I, well, I, I thank her for that. And number two, one area where, you know, we don't think about it, but aside from the videos we make of this meeting, and we don't probably get thousands of people watching that, the way people see us, the things they actually know about us is what they might read in our minutes online on our website. And to me, that was where if anyone learned about the essence of what we did and gave our best foot and our best face forward, it was Joanne that did it. In a way, she was the face of CCWD's board of directors to the public. I mean, I don't know how to express that or articulate it, but it was that. And if you read her minutes, it sort of gave you the sense of how we operated as an organization. And I'm not sure wherever anybody would get that from any other source, to be quite honest. And so I thank her for that, because I think that's one of the more remarkable things that uh, I've uh, been able to discern from her time with us here. So thank you much for making me look good to the public, if I can say it in that way. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Joanne, I, I'm always been thrilled by your cheery attitude and pleasant demeanor and in face of adversity and challenge at any level. And, and I'm, I'm really a delight working with you and you've done a stunning job. So really well done. And it's been, been a real pleasure to see you do it so professionally. So thank you gonna miss you. Thank you very much. I'm Patrick. To, yeah, if I could just, uh, I, I just want to thank Joanne too, because she makes my job easier at board meetings by keeping all of you in line and being sure that you say the motions correctly and repeats them. And I, I thank <laughs> her privately a lot, but I wanted to thank her publicly now for, for helping me with that role. And, and I remember you know, when I was uh, just a little baby junior lawyer coming to board meetings back in the in the late 90s, 
you know, it was just always, Joanne was always so nice and friendly to me and I didn't know what I was doing. And it was nice to see, you know, I, having grown up on the coast, she kind of knew who the family was and us. And, and that was just some, something that I really appreciated all these years. So thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, everyone had their piece. Um, when, of those 19 directors, I believe my father was one of them. So two generations of Michelsons, so thank you very much. And it's unfortunate you're leaving in the COVID area because right now it's real easy to put together special meetings because we're all around. Yeah, you true. To, you don't have to chase us around around That's the world right. in, in, in a no, normal, normal environment. <laughs> I've, I've taken note of that. Yeah, so you thank put it you. to all of us and collectively we all thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All your special words mean a lot and it's it's uh, it it's, makes me feel a little bit sad actually. I mean, it seemed like the time was right, but uh, it's been, that's beautiful. It's been, yes. it's been a great career. I started out uh, hired by Virginia Whelan, uh, Jackie's <laughs> mother, my, my aunt by marriage as a temporary part-time receptionist. <laughs> and um, this is where I ended up and it's been a wonderful ride. I enjoyed every bit of it. So thank so, you very much. Thank you so much and uh, as, as parting gift, they got you this beautiful vase and it will be filled with flowers and delivered shortly. So, Perfect, thank you. thank you, I love it. Thank you thank guys. You very much. Okay. Uh, Enough fluff. Yeah, thanks. Um, Superintendent, James, do you have anything else to add? Hey, Joanne, I just wanted to say thank you for all your patience, direction and tolerating us operators and our noisiness and uh, you've been, you've been a big help. So thank you so much. And we're all real happy for you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. But you still have a report to do. Yeah, you still got a report to do. You're not off the hook yet. Seems, seems so anticlimactic, but anyways. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to job. through this. Um, <laughs> as we've been, uh, as I kind of exp explained earlier or in the last meeting, as we've been working independently, we found time to do a lot of projects that we've been putting off because of other projects. So uh, we feel like we're, we're in this groove of the uh, working independently and getting all kinds of things done that we didn't think we'd be getting done at this pace. So uh, a few of those, we had a, we had a main break over in Medio and Miramar. That was six inch cast iron. Uh, that was a, a crack in the main. Um, we rebuilt the... the access hatch so it's a little safer to get in there painted the generator there uh, we just finished the annual standby uh, generator load bank testing so that we're ready for next fall um, outside of just some battery replacement i think they're looking pretty good from what i've heard um, we also rebuilt all the electrical enclosures in the pillar cedos canyon for the wells um, in preparation for a uh, disaster, we've stocked up both water treatment plants with uh, adequate lab supplies and spare parts. Um, Hawk has come in and serviced the turbidimeters and spectrophotometers in both water treatment plants. Um, we've maintained, uh, done fire break maintenance at Deniston and also Nunes. I didn't write down Deniston, but we did get that done. And we've added stock to the yard for distribution repair parts. Um, we have a new operator that just started. His name's Mike McDermott. He came over from Sims. He's got a lot of good experience and great demeanor. I think he's going to be a nice fit. Um, and delayed exams due to the COVID. April sources, Deniston Reservoir and Wells, Pillar Cedos Reservoir and Crystal Springs. Uh, a few updates on projects. Uh, after we finished the Pillar Cedos pipeline project, we had Andrini going in rock our portion of the road, so it's winterized. Um, Deniston Tank Road, we've talked about that in the generators. Uh, HDR, uh, the draft basis of design report, 30% design, uh, we just got that today. Mary and I will be discussing that with the HDR team soon. Uh, TJC um, also got together a draft uh, cost options for replacing or rehabbing the Carter Hill tanks two and three. Um, we're going to be reviewing that with them and uh, reviewing their draft report. Uh, City Works and the Esri project, we had a kickoff meeting, server set up, Miller Spatial is working on the server configuration. We're looking at a go live date probably at the end of summer. Um, and EKI is nearing completion on the Grandview and Pine Willow Oak pipeline replacement project design. If you have any questions, I'm 
Your, your pleasure. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for, for James? Okay. Um, thank you for that. And next to last item before adjournment, Director Agenda Items, request for future board meetings. Hearing none. Thank you very much. It is now 845. And Joanne, you are off the hook. It's your last meeting. I'll still, <laughs> still work on the minutes, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for Zooming in. Um, until next time. Thank you. And we look forward to uh, hearing back from the, the Finance Committee. Um, should be some good information. Thank you. Thank you all. We'll do that. Good night. Nice. Thank you, Ann. Gonna miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.